Hi, uh, welcome to the Kristen Supercook and the Left Jack Ringside Report Show. Today I have a very special guest, David Cross. He is most well known for being a stand up comedian, but you may also know David from his acting roles, from the incredibly popular Arrested Development and numerous other parts he's had in both TV and film. David is also a writer, director, and created the series The Increasingly Poor Decisions of Todd Margaret, which he was the main character on. Thanks for joining me and getting to know David. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Kristen Supercrypt Malafchak Ringside Report Show. I'm here today with David Cross, um, which funny story, uh, the way I ended up having him on my show is that um, my husband, who just also happens to be my PR person, was on Twitter uh, being funny. And uh, he has much less of a filter than I do. Um, he's much less worried about being offensive and so forth as, as I am. So people really like that. That's made him really popular. And he must have said something uh, probably insulting a Trump supporter or something of that variety on Twitter, something that made David Cross put a, a like on it. And so he just asked him, hey, do you want to be on my wife's show? And David surprisingly said, sure. So that's how he came to be on my show today. But when, when yeah. he told me that he was going to be on my show, at first he just said his name and I was like, who's that? Mm-hmm. And uh, but that's just because I suck with names. As soon as I saw his face, it was familiar to me. I've seen him in a, in a lot of stuff before. But I have not uh, watched some of his biggest things or his stand-up comedy. So I spent the last like week since I found out that he was going to be on my show um, binge watching a bunch of stuff with David Cross. So I had lots of material for today's interview. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to probably be talking a lot to David today is uh, about is uh, money, politics, and religion. Okay. Hey, what, do you remember what, or do you know what the tweet was that I responded to? Your husband's tweet? Yeah, you joined my husband's what? Do you remember what your husband's tweet was? that I've responded to? No, I don't. I don't. It was probably a meme or something that he made up. I um, love memes. <laughs> and I know and now that I've watched some of your stand-up comedy, I know you were talking about how you didn't really know how those worked. So. I don't know any well, of them. He's stuff. kind of good about making up. YouTube channel <laughs> stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> just, it's a whole different world. The vast majority of the stuff that he does on Twitter is um, colorful insults of, you know, Republicans and the GOP and the Trump administration and so forth. So um, I'm sure he probably remembers more specifically than I do. I could call him in here if you want. Yeah, that's all right. (laughs) Okay. I was kidding about the money, politics, and religion thing, but only partially. We'll, we'll get to that later. First okay. off, just can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up? Um, what were your early influences? And uh, when did you realize you were meant to be a comedian? Well, I grew up, um, the short answer is uh, Georgia, Roswell, Georgia, which is a kind of rural sub- suburb uh, outside of Atlanta, um, where it was when I was a kid. Uh, the longer answer is I was born in Georgia and then moved around constantly when I was a kid, like uh, um, at least yearly, um, uh, and lived in three places in Florida, two places in Connecticut, and then three places in New York before moving back to Georgia when I was nine. And then uh i was there until i was 19 and then i moved to boston um but 
so that's, I, I, you know, the, the easy answer is Roswell, Georgia. Um, right. uh, and, uh, like reason for all that moving or, um, my dad just got fired a lot. Um, just constantly. or he, if he wasn't being fired a lot, he would do that. Like, you can't fire me. I quit. And then he quit. <laughs> then we'd have to go somewhere else because, you know, um, he left a trail of uh, angry, um, angry debt behind him. Um, but uh, so yeah, we were we moved like once a year um, all over the place. But um, uh, and then you know I I uh, I think I I didn't know if it was going to be stand up per se, but I knew I'd be what I wanted to do, what I felt destined to do, the only thing I could do, uh, having something to do with comedy, whatever form that would be. Um, that was pretty early. I think, you know, when I was like, probably like 12 or 13, I think I saw kind of, I it was vague at first, but then it got more like, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and then I did my first, my first stand-up set ever in a, in a, you know, at the punchline in Sandy Springs, Georgia was, uh, the week before my 18th birthday it was the first one I did. And then I just kept going. Okay. Uh, next topic. I know we're all sick of talking about it, but, um. My stand-up? <laughs> I do escape right now with COVID. Um, has it? Severe. I'm never, listen, Kristen, I'm never going to grow tired of talking about COVID. Oh, no. Talking about COVID 24 7, 365, and however many 365s go into, uh, let's say 10 years, 3,650s. Okay. I mean, I'm sick of talking about it. I'm not sick of like trying to be careful about it but I'm, I'm really sick of talking about it but where are you right now where, where geographically where are you detroit detroit oh so it's pretty michigan got really really bad there for a while is it going back up oh, yeah i think um i think gretchen whitmer, whitmer did probably better than a lot of governors with trying to keep it under control though and she did get it under control and then the moment uh, people started to get careless again it, it spiked back up like everywhere else but in schools schools reopening I think had a lot to do with that yeah but now they're closed again so surprise surprise but my question to you like has it been impacting your life uh, oh. severely or coping pretty well or yeah I mean it's um outside of the obvious uh, things that we're all going through, being, being careful, not going out as much, there's not, 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 there's aren't places to go out to. Um, and uh, I'm, in, I'm in New York and um, uh, so, much is, so much stuff is, is shut down. There's no, you know, there's no theater, no cinema, no, uh, bars and, you know, as, as, as I'm sure it's the same in, in Michigan, mm -hmm. um, uh, outside of that part that we're all, uh, experiencing and, and the paranoia and the, um, and just the general discomfort you have when leaving the house, um, I haven't been able to do stand up. I, I did two outdoor sets over the summer. Things kind of calmed down in New York. The, the, governor here, whether you like him or don't like him, and I dislike him tremendously, at least his politics, um, he, for the most part, did a, you know, good job of, because it was crazy here. It was, as, as you know, this is the epicenter in the beginning, and nobody knew what the fuck was going on, and, you know, we had lockdowns, and, uh, and, and I, you know, I live in a very vibrant community. You walk outside the door and take a left or a right and there's just, you know, bars and restaurants and shops and that stuff was shuttered. Uh, uh, it was a very strange, surreal thing. And I, you know, I have a dog. I have to walk my dog at night. So I go out even though we were supposed to be inside, but I'd be out to walk the dog. And you just see there'd be nobody there, no traffic except for 
the ambulances. You'd see, you know, siren, sirens all the time. And, and then it got better and we, you know, shut down and, and, uh, and we had this thing called open streets where they would close off the streets to um, traffic and then uh, bars and restaurants could open up you know, we had outdoor dining. It was really cool, very neighborhoody, very New York kind of thing. And um, uh, and now we're back into starting to shut down again. Um, and uh, but it, it, my point in saying all that was that in the summer we relaxed things quite a bit. And uh, and I did two shows outdoors. COVID friendly, meaning, you know, people were six feet apart. There was plexiglass uh, separating, you know, little dividers um, and people wore masks, but it just wasn't the same. It wasn't good. You know, it was hard and not that great because, because with stand up, uh, the immediacy is so um, integral to the, to the experience. Like, you know, I'm here, I'm talking to you. I can make eye contact, especially when I'm, you know, developing material, which I was in the middle of. Um, and just to be outdoors and everybody spaced uh, out, and the sound isn't that great. Uh, I tried it twice and I was like, this isn't really working. So outside of those two times, I, I mean, so I haven't done stand up, and I, up until <laughs> recently, I've always done stand up a lot. Even if I was somewhere working on a show or, 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 you know, filming a movie, I always tried to do sets on my days off. And um, so that's been the biggest Thing is the thing that I do that I love to do that I you know earn a good income at uh, I haven't done I it's been uh, I think the last man, what was the last set I did I think it was in February in Atlanta I did a set in February I did some shows and uh, yeah so almost a year that's by far the longest I've ever gone without doing stand-up yeah and I know that's hard in your industry and the acting industry and have that all together um, on a larger scale. Uh, how do you think as a country we're handling it? And I know probably, you know, what you're going to say, but I saw on your Twitter feed that you shared a, uh, a video, a tweet of a video of Congressman-elect Bob Good of Virginia. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> A Republican that was uh, telling, congratulating the people at this, I think it was a baseball game or something. I don't know what it was that he was at, but congratulating the people for not wearing masks, saying it was good to see their faces. And it was obviously a hoax. Um, just the whole politics surrounding all of this. Um, when I, Cause I know since the last comedy act, I got to watch of you, COVID wasn't a thing yet. So I'd kind of like to hear about that, your perspective. I mean, uh, I mean you, you ask what I, how I think we're handling it as a country. And it's, it's not a matter of what I think. I mean, I just, just look at the cases and the, uh, preparedness we have and where we are right now with vaccines and uh, our economy and um, and what's happening at the hospitals and um, the uh, the lack of a federal uh, 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 you know authority stepping in and doing something um, uh, I mean it's not what I think it's just what is I mean just look at the information that's out there. We have the highest per capita rate of COVID. We have the um, second, third highest deaths. Uh, no, second, first highest deaths, third highest per capita cases, um, but the, the highest per capita deaths. Um, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, it, uh, a lot of this could have been prevented. It's, it's, this isn't, you know, uh, it's not what I think. It's just the case. I mean, numbers are numbers, you know, I mean, we're, it's, it's uh, shameful. Yeah. And I know that it was long before um, the COVID that you uh, poked fun at Republican party. Um, 
for obvious reasons, but I think that not just as a country, but our, the, the leadership in our government, um, there's, a, there's a pretty big divide uh, between how the Republican Party is handling it versus the Democratic Party and everybody yeah, else. I mean, for sure, the, the, um, the Democrats uh, have their own, you know, fucked up issues. And <clears throat> I don't agree with 90% of what uh, Democratic administrations uh, uh, decide the best policy is. I'm much more progressive. I'm much more, uh, I'm uh, democratic socialist. I believe in that, uh, those values. And I believe in that economic system. I believe in, um, you know, we don't need uh, Biden. I was a big Bernie supporter. You know, we need a, a like a punk FDR. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so that's where my, that's, Primaries too, Bernie. Voted for Bernie in the primaries. I voted for Bernie in the primaries. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, uh, I mean, I just believe I, I believe in those uh, that economic theory, which is proven. I don't believe in austerity. I believe, um, you know, Keynesian. You know, when you when you're going through something like this, you put money in. You 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 don't cut funds you actually give people the and this is the richest country in the history of the world and uh um you know it's 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 criminal I yeah think. and certainly immoral so um next from what i've watched of your stuff um some of it could be conceived as uh not polite offensive, a little bit cringeworthy. I know that you've been at um, the center or near the center um, of some social controversies uh, of sorts. Um, and on the one hand, I really love how comedy reminds themselves, reminds people, I, I mean, this meant to say, to not take themselves too seriously because, I don't know, people that take themselves too seriously uh, are kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah. A comedy kind of reminds people about the imperfections of humanity and to just kind of laugh with it and go along with it. Um, on the other hand, it's a time, seems of social and political revolution, uh, the way people are expected to interact with each other has been changing. Um, and this is not to attack you, to have a nuanced conversation, which I don't think we get an opportunity to do very much anymore, have nuanced conversations Agreed. about this stuff. Um, but I mean, for an example, a part of role you played in any of your defense almost 20 years ago um, was a character called Dwight Hartman in Scary Movie 2. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, my whole part of like the social activism and stuff that goes on now is that um, I try to be a voice to bring a little more awareness and understanding about disability culture because I have muscular dystrophy, I'm a lifelong wheelchair user, um, and so forth. So, um, and, and a lot of people with disabilities are misrepresented or don't have any representation a lot of the time uh, in, in film and so forth. So my question for you as, as it is, as a stand-up comedian, um, how do you balance, you know, like not offending uh, disenfranchised groups of people and not being too serious about these topics. Do you see it changing? Do you see it shift? Um, it's definitely changing. There's, there's certainly more uh, awareness, you know, what some people I think uh, um, unfortunately label as uh, overly sensitive is really just more awareness. And, um, 
and and those people who haven't had uh, a, a, a voice or much of a voice or a, a, a loud presence are now being heard. Um, so that's really the difference. And um, and uh, I do think there is a, uh, not a line, I think there is a point where uh, some people are, are don't, you know, I, I don't want to say humorless, but do, do not see the, the humor in a situation because it's uh, directly affecting them. Um, and perhaps you could make a point that they, uh, these hypothetical people I'm talking about, take themselves too seriously. Um, there certainly are, uh, things that I've said, jokes I've made, and, and punchlines that I've done in the past that were, uh, I can see now are insensitive and, uh, and the only defense is, well, it's funny. And that's not the best defense sometimes. Um, I don't have a lot of those, but I do have some uh, uh, in my past stand up or per perhaps even sketches, I'm not sure, but, um, uh, but I think the, I think the change and, uh, is mostly a good thing. And I think, um, uh, there, there are certainly things I, my wife is very, uh, uh, proactively, um, feminist and, um, uh, I had a question about that. Yeah, um, but she's told me, and we we talk about it. We don't have uh, it's it's never or very rarely defensive um, posturing, but we've certainly had discussions about um, uh, you know a joke or a bit or a a, a reference I'll make that is um, you know. Uh, potentially bothersome, you know, potentially there's, it could offend people. Um, and then we'll talk through it. And uh, I even, you know, I'll ask the audience too. I mean, when I'm developing material, um, there's a bit that I dropped. Um, and I rarely do that. Rarely, rarely, rarely do I drop a bit when, uh, but I had a discussion with people after um, I did it. It was kind of a dumb joke. Uh, and I couldn't, I just couldn't defend it. I just, it was, it made me laugh. And, uh, but if it was making a lot of people uncomfortable, so I was like, fuck it, it's not that important. I'm not making any grand statement or grand, grand point. It's funny to me, but I think a lot of, a lot of that stand up is um, sometimes, and the same with, this goes with like Twitter as well, but things that, you know, are funny when you're with your friends at the bar and that's the only time you're going to have that conversation. And I believe that people who are offended by a person, whether they know them or not, standing on stage um, uh, doing jokes can make that same joke and they wouldn't laugh at it. They perhaps would laugh at it if a friend made that joke and they were all together. It was just like four or five, six people at a bar. Is, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Actually, it reminds me of um, a, a possible response I was gonna have to what you said. And it has to do with authenticity. Um, I've seen some uh, stand-up comedians that actually have disabilities that make fun of things that have to do with disabilities, but it's, it's when they do it for me, it seems like they're finding humor in the stuff that happens to them. Um, that, that's the, 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 that's the same kind of theory of like, um, uh, you can't make a Jewish joke. I can make a Jewish joke. It's that thing that, and you can apply that to, you know, any, uh, you know, uh, gay lesbians or, uh, uh, you know, black, Hispanic, whatever. Sometimes it's funnier when it's uh, 
authentic, I guess, from my perspective. It's easier to, to listen to. It's easier to do. The entire trope kind of stuff that you see over and over and over again when you actually see somebody that's experienced some stuff that maybe other people would have never thought of, you know? I mean, we can make the same funny joke about uh, life in a wheelchair. And if I say it, it's not going to be, it's going to come off as a little like, wait a second. But if you say it, people will, uh, you know, they'll welcome it, you know? Yeah. So makes sense. Right. And uh, it, while we're on this topic, I, I saw you were one of the people in a documentary that I watched recently, uh, Call Me Lucky by Barry Crimmins. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, which was incredible. Oh, and, man. It, that... Yeah, I watched it twice. I mean, uh, what a gut punch when they, I don't want to spoil anything, but right. the movie shifts about halfway through. It's just a punch in the gut. Yeah, yeah. and it just, it ties into all of this that I was talking about, just because he was so passionate about, you know, the, the defending people and, yes. uh you know, he, he talked at one point about how people think they're rebels when they're not PC and they're just pieces of shit, basically. I mean, he, it was much more colorful than pieces of shit. I don't remember the exact words that he used. No, he was, he was all about fighting for the voiceless and the defenseless and not punching down. And I, I will often... Uh, Truly, I will think if I have a bit, and even if there's any kind of, if I have a question about it, I will think, you know, what, what would Barry have said? What would Barry think of this? What would, because uh, um, we were close and he was uh, a, a huge influence, uh, not just on my stand up, but on my, at me as a person. And, um, and just a good, a good uh, I dedicated my last special to him at the end. There's a, card that oh, wow, okay. dedicated to, to in his memory um and yeah uh i would urge anybody watching this to to and bobcat goldthwaite who is a very uh old 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 friend dear friend of barry's uh did the movie uh um directed the movie and it's just it's really fantastic it's a great and there's like a turn in the middle that I obviously knew was coming, but it's still watching it. It's just a, it's really a punch in the stomach. It's just, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had some parts in there that I, I, I cried in the middle of had tears. Yeah. Um, and, but when you said, you know, uh, when he got to the point where he was so angry and overtaken with these things that he was upset about. He stopped being funny. You know, the audience was getting angry, you know, at him. Um, but at the same time, there's nobody that you respect more. I guess what I'm trying to get at is do you think that, uh, that uh, stand-up comedians are capable of being both these kind of badass civil rights type activist people that he was, um, and also being funny at the same time. Barry's a good example of that. And, and, you know, I saw plenty of shows that he did where he uh, lost the funny part to, to, a, to a degree. And um, it was almost like berating the audience for not knowing this uh, information that, you know, this is pre-internet too. Like they're not going to have, you know, they don't know about the Chilean grape farmers, you know, and, and like he's making, <laughs> he's parading them for not understanding his joke about, uh, but, um, uh, but he knew that too. Um, uh, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, again, there's a fine line, but uh, yes, you can marry those two things for sure. Definitely. Like Carlin, Carlin's a great example, you know, Bill Hicks, uh, Lenny Bruce. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, this topic 
is um, one that you brought up in your 2019 Okaman now. I think what, that was that the name of the Kanitra. Yeah. Um, uh, being a father, being a new dad, um, I was wondering, um, how are you enjoying fatherhood? All jokes aside, I know that might be hard to do for you, but... No, I, I mean... Fatherhood. I, I love it. It's... Uh, um, she's awesome. We're... She's now... I mean, when I did that special, I think she was one and a half, I think. Um, gosh, I don't know. Yeah, two maybe, get, getting close to two, but... Um, but now it's a whole new world. I mean, we're, she's, she'll be four in February. So we're having conversations. Uh, she points things out. Uh, um, she, about six months ago, you could see this kind of sense of humor, performative personality start to emerge. And now she's full on into that. And, um, you know, as, I, as I'm sure you know, uh, uh, you know, those, when you hit those different uh, milestones, they, you know, everything's, it's, it, it's uh, new and exciting in new and exciting ways every four or five months or so. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, she's, uh, she's really starting to, you know, uh, kind of be funny beyond the way that little kids are funny like it's starting to she's starting to get you know that start that that thing um and you know uh, the good days are just amazing and the bad days suck you know when she's in a mood and whatever and that's just the worst it's mm -hmm. awful but uh um you know it's it's been challenging as it has been for everyone uh because of covid and the restrictions and she hasn't really socialized with uh too many kids um you know she had a little like this gym class thing we take her to um you know uh 15 minute walk away we'd go down there'd be this you know gymnasium place for little kids and gymnastic stuff that's all gone the Brooklyn Children's Museum, you can't, that's all gone. The Botanical Gardens can't go there. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's made it difficult, uh, you know, and uh, we'll see, we have to go, my family has to go to um, Toronto on January 6th and we're gonna move there for six months because my wife is working there and because of COVID and the, uh, you know, Canada has their shit together and they, have very strict um, quarantine rules. Uh, you know, we're we're just moving there because uh, my wife won't be able to come back and forth. Um, so we're all going up there, and we have to quarantine. And uh, we'll get like an Airbnb, and uh, and it's just going to be me, me and my wife and that kid in a stranger's house for fourteen days, <laughs> where we can't go outside, and that is going to be quite a test for a hyper almost four-year-old locked inside <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be you know without any uh, any of her or you know some of her toys or whatever but uh yeah it's gonna be interesting it'll be interesting and you and you joked before i don't know you joked in that comedy act as well about your your wife kind of being um kind of like a raging feminist <laughs> I didn't say raging. I but, didn't say raging. <laughs> no, it's uh, and about her. Uh, I saw. I think it was a, a tweet or something that I saw. It was that dancing in the street um, because of the Biden win, and that you were a little more cynical, a little more skeptical. Um, mm -hmm. But by all accounts, you actually seem very progressive. Um, I was just wondering, like, as far as is she and your political views are you mostly um, mesh or is it? Yeah, she, I mean, she's like a lot of people and I would have these very debates, we'll call them, with um, a lot of people uh, and people who engage in identity politics and um, 
uh, tribalism, uh, her, and, and this is a lot of people, lots and lots and lots of people. Her, if I just took the name and uh, sex uh, away from the person and just said, here are the policies, what do you believe in? She would align with me 99% of the time, but her chosen uh, candidates, the people that she, you know, fought for, uh, they have different uh, ideas of what policy is the best policy. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm saying if it wasn't a woman uh, and we just went by policy, I not even believe it, I know it, uh, we, we would align much more than we would. But um, I, I was uh, heavily invested in backing uh, and believed in a, an old white guy. So that negated uh, the fact that he was an old white guy May, they, some people who I believe truly would just taking all gender and age and uh, uh, race aside would align with those policies, those ideas. I agree with you on that 100%. Um, I think you made the most sense to me. But, and you've also said before you're not like the crazy enough progressive to be like, if he doesn't win it, nobody should win it. <laughs> you know, it's just oh impractical, and, and then you're not thinking of anybody else. I just think that that's, uh, you know, to just to just to. I mean, I get it. I I understand the temptation to just to go fuck it. I'm done. I you know I'm you know nothing will ever be perfect. Uh, so I'm I'm quitting. <laughs> you know, I'll just I'm just going to stick to spouting shit off on Twitter. Um, I, I can't do that. I just, I'm not built that way. I mean, I'll, uh, uh, I think I've, I think I've enthusiastically voted. I know I, I, the, the last enthusiastic vote I can read uh, in a, in a general election, um, uh, uh, was the first time I voted for Obama. That was, I was psyched about that. I was happy to do it. Every other vote, I've held my nose and swallowed the bitterness of voting for Biden or Hillary or, you know, Clinton again or Gore. I mean, I, people I wasn't excited about at all. And Obama, the second term, I wasn't excited about. Um, but uh, I still do it. And I hope for a better, I'm going to be fine. I'm like, I'm a, a relatively well-off uh, white guy. Uh, my wife's white. My daughter has, you know, rich parents is white. Has she'll get health care. It's not about. I'm not doing that for me. I don't need it. In fact, if I voted straight Republican, I'd be have more money. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, right. so I don't do it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm just going to move on to the next question because I can talk about that kind of stuff for a bit too long. Um, but speaking of your wife, gonna, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm going to have to wrap it up in a, in a few minutes if that's okay. Okay, okay. Um, I was going to ask about, because I watched all three seasons, about all three seasons of the increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margot, which is the one that you wrote, created, directed, produce started. I, I didn't direct it. It, it. We had a different director each each season oh, at a different. Okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't but everything else. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I was just watching that show. It was funny, but it was like sometimes I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry because it was like watching like the worst train wreck in history, other than maybe the Trump administration. Um, and I. I was wondering if you could give some insight into kind of the underlying message, not any plot giveaways, but just like, is it existentialism? Meaning uh, you mean, 
what meaningless survivor what wrote that message there I'm, there's, there's no there's no real message it's certainly not there's no overt message and i didn't want to i wasn't i had no interest at all in a message i, I suppose i mean uh not to give anything away but it's maybe that uh well it's interesting because the the first two series it was supposed to end after the second series we never had it going to a third series but you know um and and for obvious reasons if you've watched the show i won't give anything away but you can't have a third season so uh and the, the show came out on ifc and it didn't do very well it was like it was you know hit or miss with critics some people loved it some people hated it. I, I will say that there are not too many people who are in the middle people either usually really love it or really hate it but after the so after so it came out it didn't really do that much we did the two series co-produced and uh with channel four in, in the uk and um and then uh, you know it kicked around and then netflix bought it and Netflix started airing it. And then all of a sudden, all these people found it years later on Netflix. And then it did really good for IFC because it became like a, a cult comedy. Uh, and, and then uh, IFC years later, <laughs> was like, um, hey, they, they, they uh, asked me to meet them for lunch. And I was actually editing, it was in, down the street editing a, a movie I had made. And uh, I was like, yeah, sure. And my wife's like, they're going to ask you to do another season of Todd Margaret. I was like, no, that's crazy. You can't, we can't do that. How are we going to do it? And she's like, you watch. They're going to ask you. And we had lunch and like nice half hour catching up, chit chat. I really liked the people I worked with there a lot. And we were all friendly. And, and then they were like, so we had a question for you. And, uh, and they asked me to do a third series. And I was like, I can't. I mean, I don't know how do you do it? How, there's not, and then I reached out to one of the writers. It was, it was me and two other writers, Sean Pye and Mark Chappell. And Mark Chappell came up with the brilliant idea for ser series three, which is the only way you could do a third series. And so, uh, boy, this is really uh, digressing from your original uh, question <laughs> about a statement. But <laughs> I would say the first two series the way it ends, maybe the, maybe the message is uh, rich people can get away with anything. Um, if you're rich and connected enough, you can get away. And that's kind of, that's, that is, I, I knew the ending of that going into writing the whole thing. I knew how it was going to end. Um, but then series three kind of sort of turns that on its head. So it doesn't, that's a tough question to answer because of the nature of the show because it was never designed to go to a third series but when mark chapel came up with that idea which i thought was brilliant i was like fuck now we got to do it now i got to move to london again all right here we go i burned so. through all three seasons very quickly because um you know i, I brought them on I, it was one of those where you couldn't stop you had to know what happened next yeah, it was very I mean, you know, every every episode takes place literally where the last one left off. I mean, it's all the whole thing takes place over two weeks. Right. Uh, the first two series, and then of course the third series is super trippy and weird and meta and, uh, um, uh, but yeah, it was kind of designed. We we tried to design it that way so that you would just have to see the next thing because you knew that it was going to take you know start where the last one ended. And the guy's just getting in for deeper shit, so. And I know you said you, you only had a few minutes, so I'm gonna cut. I had a whole bunch of other questions about other shows and stuff that you did, but that's okay. Maybe we'll do another interview someday or something. But I'll go ahead and cut to the last one. Um, being a celebrity, being in the spotlight a lot, I'm sure one pain in the, neck part of being a famous is that you don't get a whole lot of privacy. But what I'm wondering is there is there anything that not many people do know about you that you wish they did know about you? Hmm. Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, 
Oh, well, all right, I'm just going to say it. Okay. All right. I'm Q. <laughs> I think that's the perfect way to wrap this up. <laughs> all right. I'm Q, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much. And, and if you could just say hi to my friend, Stephen. I wanted to introduce it. He had to work until 630. So he wasn't able to make it on here. I really wanted to say hi to you. Hi, um, Stephen. He's a big fan. There you go. He, Thank you. He made his night. And you made my night. Thank you so much for coming on here and, and talking openly and earnestly with, with me about all this stuff. I really enjoy your stuff. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So you get to get to do your stand up again. Yeah, me too. Um, well, I'm glad you got to know me and my stuff. Um, okay, cool. Well, <laughs> take it easy. Uh, you, you too. Your family, and uh, we'll see you. Thank you. No problem. Bye. Bye.